Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening if you're watching this live or recorded. I'm John Levine of Levine Electronics and Electric. We're a manufacturer's rep. The rep covers Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. We have two divisions, a control division and a power division. Please check out our website at www.l-3.com. Our philosophy is to get back to the industry to make it safer and better for everyone. We have three team members that are officers of IEEE currently, and three members that are actually on the IEEE Pulp and Paper Subcommittee. Michael McClellan, our marketing director, has been running these webinars every day um, to help our customers. You can find recordings of the ones we have done in the past on our resource page of our website. Currently, we have about 40 videos on there posted. Uh, Levine Electronics is known as the transformer, art flash, grounding, and protection experts in our territory. If you have any questions, you can type it in the chat box. We'll try to answer these at the end. We also have some handouts that you can download during the presentation. Um, we will have a short survey at the end, which we ask you to help fill out for future presentations. Certificates of completion should go out about 5 o'clock tomorrow. So without that, I'm going to now talk about one of my favorite topics, advantages and disadvantages of different types of neutral grounding systems. This is probably one of the most misunderstood topics that I present. So what is neutral grounding? Um, what I'm going to cover in this presentation is the six types of grounding. Uh, talk about advantages of high resistance grounding and chill equipment. I've actually, as long as I've done this presentation, I actually just added another type of grounding that I just found out about. So stay tuned for that because I found that quite interesting. What some of the things they're doing in Europe. Power system grounding is obviously a connection between the equipment and the earth. Um, the whole point of this is if we have a fault, we'd rather it go to ground instead of going through the person. So this is designed pretty much for industrial, commercial, not utility systems. So the six types I'm going to talk about are an ungrounded system, solidly grounded system, reactive grounded system, Peterson coil print system, which is the one I just added, uh, low resistance grounded and high resistance grounded systems. So to use electricity, electrical deficiencies are the leading ignition source and cause of fire and explosion in the world today. So NFPA has really come in and done a great job of saying what can you do to prevent it. And what I'm going to show today is one of probably the best preventive maintenance things you can do to prevent arc flash. So what's a ground fault? A ground fault is when you actually have some kind of current path between a conductor and ground. So um, it can unleash on large amounts of electricity. You may have as much as 30, 40,000 amps of fault current available. It's obviously very dangerous for people and equipment. Things can explode. So what we find is that 98% of the faults that occur start off as a phase to ground fault. So if we can prevent that, we can eliminate the majority of the issues that occur. Less than one and a half percent are phase to phase faults and about a half a percent of are three phase faults. The only time I actually see a three phase fault is a lot of times they'll shut down a system and they put shorting straps on the phases to ground just for safety. And um, that's probably the most common. They forget to take the ground straps off. Probably the most common source I see for that. There's two types of faults. There's a bolted fault and an arcing fault. Now your first perception for a lot of customers is that the bolted fault is actually a worse fault than an arcing fault. The thing is with a bolted fault, the equipment is designed with what's called an AIC rating amps interrupting capacity. So the system should be designed 
to handle these bolted faults. The problem occurs in arcing faults. With an arcing fault, what actually happens is my, I may have some resistance in the circuit. So because of that, the current levels are going to be lower, but the time then becomes longer. And so it becomes actually a worse type fault. Um, so what's an arcing fault? Here I'm actually showing where you've got some insulation that's starting to break away. And here's just another picture showing it. And it's just, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off, which I'm actually going to show in the next slide. So this actually can be really a problem. Um, ungrounded systems, because of a capacitive charging current, these levels can get extremely high. I've actually seen 2,800 volts on a 600 volt ungrounded system. So an arcing fault, it's usually caused by insulation breakdown between two phases or phase and ground. The current, as I mentioned earlier, is much smaller. It may be 25 to 40 percent of a bolted fault. Because of that, the protective devices are going to react slower because it's a lower level of current. The arc faults can be very destructive because of the intense energy that's given. And the majority of the stress, thermal and mechanical, are not confined within the bus bars. So it goes into the compartment and you get this big loud boom when it blows up. An arcing fault, as I mentioned, is an intermittent fault between phases or phase to ground. Because of it, what we find is that um, a three phase bolted fault will have about 89% of the current, line to line about 74%. But line to ground, you may be down in the 38 to 40 percent range. So because of that, um, you can end up having a much worse case. And when arc flash studies are done, this is part of the reason they got to check virtually the whole system to see what the worst case is. Do an issue. Here's what you actually have on an arcing fault. So I've actually got the voltage here, and what happens is. In this case, this is a 40 volt system. The voltage had to get up to about 300. This is the voltage line. The voltage gets up to about 375, and then my current starts. So the current is actually starting here. When my sine wave goes through zero for voltage, because the current lags voltage by 90 degrees approximately, I still have an arc. But when I get to this point, the arc goes out because the voltage is not high enough to sustain it. And then I get the same thing. When I go on the other side, the voltage gets to about 375, the current starts again. And so you, you have this very on and off, on and off type situation with an arcing current. And I'll show you why this is such a problem. And the reason is, not only do we have, you may not have enough, you have an ungrounded system as an example, that I've got capacitance because I've got cables next to each other but I don't have anything else. And it's like, literally like me turning on and off a switch right here. And what happens is I could literally be charging these capacitors, okay? And you could actually on an ungrounded system see six to eight times over voltages on that system. I've got a customer here in Atlanta, 600 volts ungrounded paper mill, and we've measured over 2,800 volts on that 600 volt system. Needless to say, the equipment's not designed for that. So it's a major, major problem. So you need to take something. If you know anybody that's got an ungrounded system, it is a major issue. Okay? You need to get somebody like me involved to see what we can do. Because they can improve the system. And why do people go to ungrounded systems? Why would them inherited them from the original designs? Why were the original designs going to ungrounded? So the 50s and copper is expensive. The war. No, it wasn't the, it wasn't the cost. It was, it, it's actually reliability. Because when the first phase goes to ground, I can continue to operate. I actually like ungrounded systems for that reason. And on ships, that's why they did it. So when the bomb goes, the first phase goes around, you keep operating. Here's a, a graph actually showing what happens. And you can see, because those capacitors keep charging, in this case, I think this was a 1385 volt phase to ground system. 
and I have almost 10,000 volts that ends up developing on the system. There used to be a thing called the buff book, and basically it talked about how you could have six to eight times over voltages on a ground fault situation. So, so now let's go back. Oops. Let's talk about ungrounded systems. An ungrounded system, I can have two types of loads. I can have three-phase loads and phase-to-phase -phase loads. There is no phase-to-ground because there is no ground. Or phase-to-neutral, there is no neutral. So what you have, you actually still have a connection to ground, but it's only done through the capacitance. I've actually gone up to systems and measured between ground and A phase and seen like 277 volts. Then I measured a B phase and I see 380 volts. Then I measured a C phase and saw like 30 volts. Bill, you're nodding your head. <coughs> I think that you've seen that too. That was actually an ungrounded system. Ground is just a reference point because the capacitance on the system wasn't even. That's why you saw different voltages in the system. Okay? Because ground is just a reference. But you're really, all you're seeing is that capacitance. So it's a real issue on that. Ideally, what you've got is if those capacitors are equal, your neutral should flow right in the middle. Okay? So that's the ideal situation. And I'm going to show you in the next slide what happens if one phase goes to ground. While I'm on this slide, and the reason I put this arrow on here is I do a lot with metering, also with multi -limb. And a lot of customers, they'll say, my power factor shows is 0.2. And I know that's wrong. Why is that wrong? No idea. It's basically unity. No, you should have a lagging. You know, motors. It was negative. It was negative. They were saying 0.2 instead of like 0.8 or 0.85. And the reason is their currents and voltage weren't together. You know, I need A phase voltage connected to A phase current, B phase voltage connected to B phase current. So I, since I'm on this slide, I'm just going to give you a tangent. So here's A phase voltage, here's B phase voltage, here's C phase voltage. Knowing those three things, can you tell me if this is ABC rotation or ACB rotation? Only from the direction of the arrow. So from my arrow, what is it, ABC or ACB? I got one vote for ACB. I got another vote for ABC. I love it. The way you look at this is you're staying stationary and these vectors are moving. Okay? So if I'm standing right here at A, what's the first thing I see? That's VA. What's the next thing I'm going to see? This current, which this should be the A phase current. The next voltage I would see is B because the voltages are going around. Okay, so in this case, this actually is ABC phase rotation. All right, the other thing, if you can see the vector diagram, is the currents. What do I expect the currents to do? Lead or lag the voltage? Lag. So if this is my A phase voltage, I expect my A phase current to be somewhere between here and here. Right here, if the A phase current is right on top of the voltage, what's my power factor? One, that's unity. If I had a 100% inductive load, then I would expect it to be here at uh, 90 degrees. Okay. And so here's the B phase current and there's the C phase current. So what happens if one of those phases goes to ground on an ungrounded system? Well, in this case, I've got A phase going to ground, right? Where's the neutral relative to the ground? We know it's, if, say it's a 277, 40 volt system. We know that it's going to be at 277 volts. So what happens is B phase and C phase relative to ground, now we're not at 277. They float up to 480 volts relative to ground. Okay. Now, is that a problem? Insulation level. It's not because all the equipment is designed for 600 volts. So because of that, that's not going to be an issue because your system's designed for that. And when I get into neutral grounding, because of that, that's one of the principles we utilize. Okay? So what happens is 
I didn't show it here. Going back to the slide. Well, I guess I'll show it in the future slide. Okay. So it's real important to realize that the other two phases relative to ground. And ground is just a reference point. It's going to be at 480 volts. And your capacitive charging current is about one amp on each leg. So I end up with about three amps of capacitive charging current. And that's what I'm showing in this slide. So in this case, I've got a phase current here going to ground. I've got a dead short. So what happens is the other two phases relative to ground go up to 480. So their currents are going to go up by the square root of 3. So we'd see about 1.73 amps. And if you do the vector math on it, it comes out to 3 amps. So you end up having 3 amps circulating in the circuit. Now, people always ask me, how do you find a ground on an ungrounded system. The way they do it is with ground lights. So if this is normally balanced and I'm floating right at 277 volts, relative to ground, all three of these, I'll have 277 volts on the primary. So these lights are going to be on dim. If I end up having this phase go to ground, this voltage is going to go to ground, right? And what do these two voltages do? They float up to 480. So because they flow up to 480 volts, their lights are going to come on bright. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they, they shouldn't pop because you should have designed the ground system to see that. Yeah, but then they pop. And then they, pop. they may pop. I was out at Lockheed one day. I was at Lockheed, and we're, they're walking through the plant, and I go, oh, my God, you've got a ground on the system because it was an ungrounded system. And because one light was out, the other two were bright. So what's the guy tell me? Huh? Yeah, exactly. He goes, it's not a ground. The light's burned out. The problem, though, he could have had a ground and not known it. And if you have a ground on one phase, it's not a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. Because we still got a good operating system. But what happens is if a second phase goes to ground? Goes to now I've got a line-to-line -line ground fault. So I've got a major problem with that. Okay. So if you have a ground on an ungrounded system, you need to go find it so you don't have a second ground. Okay? So there's a lot of advantages on ground, which is why I kind of said I like it. You have a low-value current flow for the ground faults, because typically it's going to be 5 amps or less. I showed you it was typically about 3 amps. There's no flash hazard to personnel. I can continue to operate on the first ground fault, and the probability of a line-to-ground escalating is very small, because I've got a little low of a current. So it's really a nice system. There's some problems, though, with ungrounded systems. It's difficult to find the ground fault. Okay? How do you find the ground fault on an ungrounded, ungrounded system? The whole point they went to ungrounded was they could operate, right? Continuous to operate. How do you find the ground fault? There's only one way. I start flipping off circuits. Okay? That's the only way to find it. And hope you, the fault goes away, and then you can isolate it that way. So let me give you an example. One of my buddies calls me up and goes, I got a problem up in my attic. I need to do some work on the electrical. And I've turned on every off every breaker one at a time, and the lights in the attic never went out. You did. What was the problem? Circuits were tied together, but thank goodness they're on the same phase. Exactly. Okay. So what so what I told him to do was exactly what you probably had to do. I had to turn off everything and then turn them on one at a time. And sure enough, two of the breakers were tied on the same side. I didn't realize there were two things tied together until I pulled the pot off the breaker and it arced when it got close to the can. Wow. Mm. I think we're back, still hot. <laughs> There's something else that you know. Exactly. I'm so the European pan board What? And that way the European circuit. No, the European circuit, they use a Y system typically. And it's 380 is their three phase voltage. But if you take the square root of 380, you get 240. So instead of using 120, 208. Right, but I mean they're loop, they loop their circuits from other which is basically what you have there, two breakers tied in. I am not sure yeah, how they right. do that. Okay. 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 You talk to residential first, so well, they do put a ring bus around the room. Oh, they do put a ring bus on it? Mm -hmm. They pick off of that. 
Interesting. Devices. Okay. Um, but it is difficult to find the fault. So you got to shut down the system. And the whole point of that went down grounded was so they don't have to shut down and continue to operate. It doesn't control transient over voltage. I'll talk more about that in a future slide. Cost of system maintenance is because you got to go find the ground fault. I've had some customers that had ground faults that were on outdoor lights in a junction box. You know, it's very difficult to find it sometimes. And as we mentioned earlier, second ground fault on another phase gives you a face-to-face -face short. So then this next system we're going to talk about is solidly grounded systems. In a solidly grounded system, you can have three types of loads. I can have a three-phase load. I can have a line-to-line -line load. But now I also can have, we claim it's a line-to-neutral, right? But where's the neutral connected? To ground. So the reality is you have a line-to-ground connection. That's pretty scary to me, right? Somebody could literally take and connect the load side of a load to ground, and that circuit would work because the neutral and the ground are tied together. So my question to you now is, what's the difference between neutral and ground? Okay. Exactly. A neutral is designed to carry current. A ground is not designed to carry current. Okay? So, so that's the difference. But you can't have these three kind of loads. The reason this is so popular is because you can have a much less expensive system. Because all my single phase loads, I can just operate between a phase and ground. You know, you don't have to have a transformer to handle that single phase load. So now let's talk about three phase ground systems and short circuits. Now, I like to do a lot of rules of thumb. So the first rule of thumb is you need, to, most of us are engineers, you need to know how to get from current to KVA. All right, at 480 volts, if I have a 1,000 KVA transformer, how much current do I have? You take all the square root and do the square root. It's very simple. It's 1,200 amps. So if you can remember 1,000 KVA is 1,200 amps, I can use that as a basis for anything. Okay? So think of it, my current at 480 is going to be 20% more than the KVA number. So in this case... <laughs> I've got a 1500 KVA. The reciprocal of 23 is 1.2. The, the reciprocal of. You divide 1000 by 23 1, right? It's root 3 to 480. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Right. So I it's, never realized it's 1. It's 1.2. 1. Yeah. So, um, so in this case, I've got a 1500 KVA. So I can tell you right off the bat. I know it's a thousand, it's twelve hundred amps plus six hundred amps. It better be eighteen hundred amps. Okay. And sure enough, and I've got an impedance here of six percent. So the question is, what's my short circuit? And you can work this multiple ways. So sure enough, it's eighteen hundred amps is my full load current. And to get the short circuit, all we do is take the full load current, divide it by the impedance, and that's going to give you your short circuit current, right? And I could do it per unit, which I did in this case. But in this case, you know, the 1800 divided by 0 0.06, I come up with about 30,000 amps for short circuit current. Another thing is a rule of thumb, if you think about it, is if I could take, and I use this as my rule of thumb, if I want to quickly know what my short circuit is, I'll just double KVA and add a zero. So 15, 1500 KVA is about 30,000 amps. 1,000 would be about 20, okay? So it's a real quick way of knowing it. Um, when I get to motors, I'll give you one on that too. Now, so, so a three-phase short, you ended up, you got the 6% impedance is all you've got, so it's 30,000 amps. The next thing I'm going to do is align to ground. And align to ground, I've got the 6% impedance, but I've also got a, some impedance from the phase of the ground circuit. So typically, that's about 2%. So if you add those two together, in that case, I'm going to have more resistance. So my ground fault current will be a little less than three-phase. So it's about 22,000 amps. And then the third condition is a phase-to-phase -phase type short. Oh, excuse me. 
back to the face, line to ground. If I work that backwards, but we have an issue with line to ground faults or three face fault because what's happened is in this case, I've got um, through this Y Delta transformer using 13.8 on the primary. I ended up with a 447 amps reflected back on the primary. I had a case over at Alabama Power where we blew the fuses on the primary twice. Alabama Power was not happy with my customer. Okay. Because on a solid grounded system, this is what you could get. This is going to be another advantage of going to resistive grounding. Um, a line to line short, what happens is now I've got to go through two windings. So my impedance doubles. So you think it'd be even fault. Problem is, remember, we talked about voltage escalating. My voltage between the two lines is 480, not 277. So because of that, end up with about 26,000 amps of fault current on a line to line fault. Okay. What happens is that was all based right at the transformer. I've got additional impedance that could be between the motor and the transformer. So maybe your fault current's less half, approximately. Okay. So this will just give you a good feel of what that available fault current is on solid grounded systems. Needless to say, I do not like solid grounded systems. They're very dangerous. Um, the Red Book, which is another book, talks about the highest probability of escalating to a three-phase fault is on a solid grounded system. For this reason, ground fault protection is required for systems 1,000 amps or more for NEC. Uh, 230-95. I ran into a bunch of customers because they put the ground fault on the mains, right? They end up having a ground fault. What trips? Main. The main. How do I go find the ground fault? <laughs> it means you're setting the highest level on the ground fault. So all of a sudden, this guy goes, I can't ever get the system restarted. What you're going to have to do is turn everything off, turn on the main, hope it doesn't trip, and literally one by one, go start troubleshooting to find out where the fault is. It's, it's, it's what the codes require, but it is the cheapest design. Okay. Um, the advantage is it does control transient over voltages, which I'll talk about. It's not difficult to lock at the fault. Just look at where the smoke came out, right? And you can use it to supply line to neutral, or as I like to say, line to ground loads. The disadvantages are multiple. You can have severe flash hazard, got a huge amount of current. Main breakers could probably gonna be required for NEC. You can have loss of production. Equipment damages can be severe. I've got hollow values of fault current, and the chances of a single phase fault escalating into a free fight is all very high. Because as soon as those ionized gases get in there, everything's gonna blow up. And you could create primary issues on the primary system. So, any questions so far? So now let's talk about neutral grounding resistors. And neutral grounding resistor is exactly what it says. I got neutral and grounding, and I'm putting a resistor between the neutral and the ground. That's all we're doing with neutral grounding. Okay? Very simple. They do it a lot, manufacturers may do it a lot of different ways. They may just use a resistor. They may turn around and put a, res a transformer and a resistor. Okay. Now, what do we know? In this case, this resistor is going to control the amount of current that can go through the secondary, which by definition, a transformer, it's a direct ratio. So that'll limit the amount of current that goes through the primary. And I leave it up to the manufacturer what the best way to do the system is. The first thing I'm going to talk about is reactive grounding. I typically see this on large 46 kV systems and above. An inductor, which is what a reactor is, doesn't want to have current change quickly. So what it's going to do is it'll limit that current and slowly it'll let that current increase over time. So that's how a reactive type grounding system works. Rarely do I see that on what I call medium voltage, 15 kV low low voltage. The one that I just learned about this year is actually called the Peterson coil. Has anybody here heard of the Peterson coil? Cool. Get to teach you something new. 
the way a Peterson court works. This is something used in Europe. And we know we have capacitance in the system. What they actually do is they add an inductor, and they end up adding the inductor to cancel out what the capacitance is. So if I add the inductor to cancel out the capacitance, those end up as zero. So I have a high, very high number. I have no So basically, I've made it a pure ungrounded system. Okay? So you're going to go, that's interesting. How do they find the ground? Or what happens if there's a ground? To do that, because this capacitance is changing, I've got to be continuously changing this inductor. So this thing to me is really ugly. How they do it? Huh? It literally is a motor driven and they drive this inductor coil up and down. They've got push. I think this must be used primarily on medium voltage. But they've got bushings. They've got the motor driver. They've got to have a position indicator. This is actually an oil filled tank they use. There's a plunger coil which is going up and down. They've got a breather, an air gap. There's got to be a spindle, a yoke. So you can see this is a very complicated system. But you could actually use it to do it. They vary the inductance to compensate. Adjusting the core. They adjust, exactly. They adjust that core to compensate for whatever the capacitance is. And you've got to have one of these per leg. So it's the three of these to adjust each capacitance. Obviously, they've got to have some kind of automatic tuning device. Okay? And what was interesting when I got into this, I'm obviously the GE Multilin rep, and we sell relays all over Europe. I actually realized that Multilin has what they call a transient ground fault detector circuit. And this is actually my H series relay or my UR, which I've got in the back of the room, can actually, in, in the manual, we talk about ground fault protection for Peterson Coil. So what we've got to do is I've got to be able to see that low level current and we actually monitor the direction of it. I've got what's called a zero sequence CT around all three conductors. And by monitoring that current direction, I can actually see it. So there's an option in the multi lin relay to be used with a Peterson coil, which I thought was kind of interesting. Okay. Any questions on the basic theory of how those two work? There's two types of resistive grounding. There's low impedance grounding and high impedance grounding. So low impedance means I'm going to have a high current, typically two or 400 amps. High impedance, I typically limit the current to five amps. So let's talk about low impedance. Typically, I use this on medium voltage systems. I'm typically serving motor loads. I'll usually limit it to two or 400 amps. And the systems are typically shut, designed to shut down in 10 seconds. So that's what we call low resistance or low impedance grounding. Okay. So in this case, what happens is instead of having the 30,000 amps, limit that current to 400 amps on a phase of fault. Okay. If I look at what's reflected on the primary, I'm only seeing about 40 amps, so I don't need to worry about blowing up primary fuses, which is nice. Okay. What we do is I don't want to shut down the main breaker on that. So what we'll do is we'll put what's called a zero sequence CT down by the motors. And a zero sequence CT just goes around all three conductors. And we expect the current to go out to be the current coming back. And if it's not, I can have that sense and then I can trip off the device that's right there. Okay. When I was actually doing this presentation, checking over it again last night, I realized these CTs were actually sized wrong. Oh, no, maybe they're not. Well, this says 2400 or 4160. I'm going to give you another rule of thumb. On a motor, okay, take a 10 hours for a motor at 480 volts. How much current does that draw? How much? What's that motor? 10 horsepower motor, 480 volts. Very close. 14 amps. So that's a great rule of thumb. Instead of 20%, it's going to be 40%. Okay? So the 10 horsepower is going to be 40. So 100 is going to be about 140. 
slightly less. Okay, so 14 amps. In 4160, my rule of thumb, it's funny that it, it turns out to be the same number, but it's 0.14. Okay, <clears throat> so if this was a thousand horsepower motor in 4160, I expect it to be about 140 amps of current. Okay, I could use a 400 amp CT, but typically on motor protection, I want it just slightly higher than what the full load current of the motor is. So I would actually put 150, a 200 amp CT. If this was a 4160, the reality is this probably was a 2400. So I know since the current's be double, 140 be 280. And the 280, I'd probably use a 400 amp CT. So it's funny how all the, the math does work, which I love. 2400 volt line lines. Yes. Um, yeah. And they're 1385 to ground. So, yeah, I see a lot of that. A lot of them are switching over to 4160. But you will run across a lot of 2400 volt systems. Bill, you've probably seen 2400. Yeah, no. Oh, okay. Mining paper, sugar. Yeah, pipe, mining, pulp and paper, a lot of mills are still that. Carl and I have definitely seen it. <coughs> There's some advantages and disadvantages to low resistance grounding. I'm still going to have a relatively large ground ball current, two to 400 amps. So I'm going to need to shut the system down in 10 seconds. The fault of machine is definitely going to be shut down. The starter fuses may opera, also operate and I must have an upstream breaker. So if they don't trip, I trip the main breaker. The advantage is I do look at a large part of the machine windings and this is where I'll get into this in another, one of the questions that was asked was just, when do I use high impedance grounding or low impedance grounding? You know, what's the advantage? And if I have a poorly trained maintenance team, then I don't want, I want to shut something down. I don't want to use high resistance if I don't have an educated sales maintenance force. Okay. To me, the single best system out there is high resistance grounding or not especially at 40 volts. So we're going to talk about that. In high resistance, I can have three phase loads and phase to phase loads, that, but I cannot have any phase to ground loads. Here's an example. The reason you can't have any single phase loads is if I have, in this case, one phase to ground, what happens to the neutral? The neutral now is now at zero. It's floated up to 277 volts. So now I've got this load that's actually going between, you know, 277 and 480. It's not relative to ground. So that's a very dangerous situation. If somebody happened to grab this line, they're going to get shocked. I heard about a guy who went up into a ceiling of a gymnasium, grabbed the neutral side, thinking it was at zero volts at one. And he, in that case, it was, this side was open and the guy got killed because he actually was seeing line to ground, okay? So in high resistance grounding, to calculate what your ground fault current is, I still know I've got capacitive charging current. So that's about one amp. I've got about, if I use a 55 ohm resistor, I'm gonna have five amps through the resistor, 277 volts across here, it's about, about 55 is five amps. So if you do the math, we have about 5.83 amps of total current, okay? And here I show the math. So I've got five amps resistive, three amps capacitive, A squared plus B squared, end up with 5.83 amps in the system. That's a very low number. So obviously I can maintain it and monitor the system. And once again, what did we do? One phase went to ground, the other phase went up to 480 volts. But that's safe to operate because everything was designed at 600 volts. So the, one of the questions that was sent in was, which I thought was a great question, I don't know who asked it, but why do the appropriate lighting and arrestor values change between a solidly grounded and a low impedance grounded system? Okay, and what's the answer? If I have a solid, let's say I have a 4160, a 4160 volt system, which I actually had this city of Atlanta water treatment plant, it was at 4160, Solidly grounded system. So if it's a solidly grounded system, what would you use for lightning arresters? What would they be rated? 
How many volts? At least 2,400. 3,000 volts, right? I'd use 3,000 volts for resters. Well, what happened was they went back and changed it to a low voltage grounded system. What happened when they had the first ground fault? Ground, and the other two phases went up to 4160, burned up the lightning rusters. So they called me out and said, why did these burn up? And the reason they burned up was right here. When they changed that system, they needed to change the lightning arresters to 4160 volt rated. Okay, makes sense. Very simple. Um, I'll show this in another slide. What happens to MOVs on drives? Carl, you've probably seen this. Have you seen MOVs in drives? They've got them sometimes connected between well, phase and ground. Yeah, the, the topology varies, but all of them have it. And it ranges, you know, we talked about sizing, you know, on the 40 volt drives, manufacturers say they're 1,500 to 3,000 volts. When we're testing, we actually seen them withstand 10,000 volts, you know, through uh, um, capacitor discharge testing, you know, like simulating right. lightning strikes. Um, and with a surge protector, we actually were able to withstand 20,000 volts. Well, what happens is you know, they actually have a document, and I'll show this in a future slide, where if you've got phase to ground, they actually tell you to turn them off well, on neutral grounding systems yeah, or higher systems. Yeah, there's a whole section because European design drives, they have the EMI, EMC filter that you have to disengage. Correct. Thing that has a and grounded or grounded. Yeah, for solid, right. or be phase grounded. Yeah. So I'll show you that slide of that. Okay, so on high resistance grounding, you know, the beauty is I've only got five amps of current going through the resistor, so I have a tenth of an amp on the primary. So I have no concern about tripping fuses on the primary. The thing about, we talked about ungrounded systems, and because I've got that capacitor charging, I can have this six to eight times over voltage. This slide is probably the most important slide in the whole presentation. And the reason for that is what you want to do is you want, if this is ungrounded, this resistor is zero, I'm sitting right here, and I'm going to have that six to eight times over voltage. So what you want to do is you want your resistor value to be greater than your capacitive charging current. So that's why we end up having that five amps resistor versus a three amp capacitive charging. I'll be right here and I'll be on the flat part of the curve. So I can limit that transient over voltage to about two and a half times. So that's the whole thing. And what's cool about like a post clever resistor, we can actually calculate that capacitive charging current. And I'll show you that in another slide. Back to your slide, I'll show it. So in this case, what we can do is I could actually, I've got this fault that I've created here. So I know what the current is here. So using my previous example, I'd have 5.83 amps of current here. I know I've got five amps of current here. So using A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or, or C squared minus A squared equals B squared, I could calculate what that capacitive charging current is, is about three amps. So if you actually buy what post lever calls a, a pulsar plus net, I'll actually calculate that so we can make sure we size the resistor properly. I actually, and I'll show it in another slide, offer a tester where we can test a fault on a system too, which is kind of cool. All right, when you go to do that, how are motors wired? Motors could be wired either in a delta configuration or a Y configuration, depending on the application. So in this case, I'm going to first talk about a delta. If I have a fault right here at the line, and it's a high resistance grounded system, I'm going to have five amps of current flow, right? Makes sense. If the fault is right in the middle, I know I've got 480 volts between here and here. I'd have 240 volts. I'm going to be sitting here. I'm going to have at least two and a half amps of current that flows. So with a pulsar system, I can find that fault, most likely. Okay? And I'll show you how to find faults in a future slide. My issue comes in is if a motor is wired in a Y configuration, then this in theory is at zero. This is now 
not at 480, but at 277 relative to that, so that current can actually go real low. So if that current gets real low, I may have trouble finding the ground fault. Okay, and that's just a disadvantage of high resistance system. And there's some tricks I can do. I can lower my resistance value and play some games to try and find it. And we'll talk about how to find it in another slide. So the way we're going to do it is similar to what we did before on low impedance. And here I'm just showing a multi lens 369, but we're going to use a zero sequence CT <clears throat> once again. So if I have a fault, hopefully I can trip the motor in the feeder circuit closest to that fault and keep the system up and running. You know, with five amps, I don't have to shut down the system. So I've got all the advantages I had with an ungrounded system. But I don't have that contrasting at all voltage. So that's why I love high resistance systems. Now, in this case, I'm showing a 2001 CT. Sometimes you'll see customers use a 50 to 5. Because all I'm using is a zero sequence. I need to know the differential of current. Okay. And in a high resistance, I'm limiting the current to 5 amps. If I use this 2000 to 1, instead of coming into my 5 amp input on my multi lens relay, I can actually come into a 0.025. I take that 5 amp, lower it down to 0.025. So this is just a little quicker and more sensitive. I could actually go to 0.001% instead of 1% accuracy on the, if I need to get real sensitive. So that's how we do it. And this was showing a 2400 volt system, which kind of went back to that slide I showed before where they had the 400 to 5 CT. Um, here I'm just kind of showing what your resistance value at 480 volt. We typically use a 55 ohm resistor. You're going to have about 1300 watts. And I get into 4160 volt systems. High, and I'll show you a slide of that. So high resistance. Um, we have low value, fault current, no flash hazard, control the transient over voltage, no equipment damage. I can continue to operate, no impact on the primary system, and it's very easy to find ground faults, which I'm going to show you now. Okay. That's funny. I'm asking any questions so far. Any questions? Do you have any questions? Anybody from the peanut gallery? Okay. So how do we find faults on ungrounded systems? What we say you had to do, you start flipping off all the circuit breakers. Solid grounded systems, how did we find them? Well, we just look for the smoke. Low resistance, you know, hopefully the device closest to it, the zero sequence CT caught it, we find it. But high resistance is a little tougher. So on high resistance, if you have something like the post cover pulsar, alarm's going to indicate where the ground fault is. Technician can confirm it. I'm going to have voltage on the metering relay, current going through the ground resistor. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have a substation, zero sequence CT. So I could actually put zero sequence CTs on all the substations if I wanted. And then we're going to grab a, go out and find it. And I'll show you that in the next slide. And I actually did this for a customer. Evaluate what you got to do. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this zero sequence CT. And this one happens to be what? They call it Rogowski coil, which is pretty cool. It's this one's actually a 36 inch, so it is flexible. So you can put it around all three conductors very easily. And I expect that current going out would be the current going back. If it's not, then you can sense that. So what we do with a pulsar system is literally I have a contactor, and you can short out part of the resistor. So what I'll do is I'll have it going between 5 amps, 7 amps, 5 amps, 7 amps. <coughs> if you need the restroom, it's around the corner. <coughs> In this case, I've got a ground fault right here. So what happens is I've got current going back here. So if I put a CT right here around all three conductors, I see that 5 amp current. If I go to this leg, the current going out, same current coming back. So I see zero on my meter. If I come over to this point right here, I'm still seeing the current. So I'll see it flopping between 5 amps and 7 amps. Literally, you could put it in the conduit, around the conduit, and 
because the ground should be going another path. If I go past it, it goes to zero. So you can actually find where that fault is. So that's how we find it. I had a case in a brick plant that was ungrounded. I put in a portable system and I went to the main switch gear, saw the ground fault. The way this building was set up, it went out to a telephone pole and that force it came down and they had two disconnects, one fed an MCC, and one fed another building. So I put my hand meter around one of them, got nothing, went to the other, saw it packing, went to the main break, incoming feed of this MCC, put around the incoming, sure enough, still had it packing. I got lucky in the MCC, the feeder cables were going out the top. So I ground my Rogowski coil and ran about, went around four or five conduits at one time. Okay, first set, I got nothing. Second set, I went around, I'm sitting, I'm still pegging. So then I isolated to which conduit it was. Because it was an MCC, we could open up the trough. And I found out which circuit it was. Turned out, long story short, it was a space heater and a motor that was going to ground. So you literally can find the fault on these high resistance grounding systems. Um, we actually offer for rent a tester. So you could actually, I can come out there, or one of my guys, we can connect this to the system. And I literally, if you've got a high resistance ground system, I will put a fault on that system. Okay. And I have a very good methodology so that I make sure there's not a fault on the system before we start. But we could actually use that for training your personnel or testing the system to find out where the fault is. Okay. Um, we also offer audits. So a lot of paper mills will go and do an audit. Um, we did one for a paper mill that had about 100 MGRs. It's a big paper mill. And we found that probably over half were bad. Uh, a lot of the resistors may have burned up or the controls are working on the pulse sources. So that's the service we also offer. Um, the NEC 2017, you know, high beams grounded is allowed. The condition of maintenance and supervised ensures that only qualified personnel service the installation. So you need qualified people. Ground detectors are installed and lined and neutral nodes are not served. So NEC does address HGRs. Um, temperature rise, just so you know, if you're using an HGR, the system can get up to 385 degrees. So you don't want to be touching it. On the resistive grounded, I could get up to 760 degrees. If I compare the four ungrounded um, current, an ungrounded high resistance is typically less than 5%. You have about 5% on local resistance, effective ground 100%. Transient over voltage, as we, we talked about, ungrounded is the worst. Auto fault location, ungrounded was no. You know, you got to turn off circuits, the rest is yes. Immediate disconnect. Um, ungrounded, and this is optional on high resistance. Typically, we don't shut it down, but you're going to have to shut down on low resistance effective when grounded. They say if there is a ground, you should replace windings in all cases, but if I've got low or effective grounded checks of re core restacking maybe on motors is often. And multiple, this is typically underground systems or older systems, so that's why it's multiple faults. I square T damage is low on, the, on these two systems on this. It's interesting when I did this analysis, comparing high resistance to low resistance, and I just compared 5 amps to 20,000 amps. Well, your thermal damage is RMS squared over time. Your mechanical damage is the peak squared. It turns out, going to solid versus high resistance, you got 16 million times more damage on a solid ground system. Um, the reason I like high resistance, there's no shutdown when a ground fault occurs. I can quickly identify where the problem is. Now, when I do have that first ground, I need to go find it. It's much safer for personnel, offers all the advantages of ungrounded, and no none, no none disadvantages. So question sent in is, why should I use high resistance for instance, lower solidly? Well, solidly, you know, the high resistance, the beauty is I limit the current, I can continue to operate. Low resistance, you're still going to be shutting down something. And solidly grounded, you're definitely going to. 
So that's the advantages of it. Okay. Should high resistance ground to be used to prevent heart flash to personnel? What do you think? Absolutely. It's a no-brainer to me. You know, um, that phase to ground fault, which is probably going to be how it occurs, you're not going to damage personnel. Okay? He is safe working in front of it. In theory, okay, and this gets to my next question. Absolutely, since 98% of faults start off as a phase to ground, this would lower the current spots in fault. So now, can I lower the ASC rating of my equipment? No. Why not? I still can have a face-to-face -face fault. That personnel still has to suit up. But the chances of it getting blown across the room is much less. You know, so that's why it's far superior. No, because you still can have face-to-face. -face. So you still got to rate it for ASC rating. Um, I get into a lot of retrofit applications. So some of the things you need to be concerned with are the correct cables rated line to line? I've actually seen some old systems because they knew it was solidly grounded. They used Fiat 300 volt cable instead of 600 volt cable. Are surge arresters and MOVs on the system? Are they sufficiently rated? We've talked about that. Are the neutral so the transformers fully insulated? This is one that came up. I was doing this presentation <coughs> to power IEEE PES, and um, Georgia Power Guy said we don't fully rate the, the neutrals. They actually taper the neutral. So where the neutral is connected to ground is a low voltage rating. And when it gets all the way up to the neutral, it's fully rated, which I never knew, heard before. And are there other sources for generator tiebreakers you need to be concerned with? Here's my slide. If you go to the manufacturer's slides, they'll actually have a note in there. Install it on a ungrounded high resistance or B-phase grounded. Disconnect the phase to ground MOV circuit. So they actually have a jumper you need to remove. Yeah, or the uh, filters. Or the filters. The other thing is the yeah. Down. So the capacitors, which is part of the filter circuit. So they'll have you jump, remove those. So you need to be aware of that. Um, I actually was doing this at a plant that was ungrounded, and they didn't realize that. So they went through the plant and ungrounded everything. Others. So how do you do it? I may still have some single phase loads. I need to service those loads. So what do you do if you take a solidly grounded system and change it to a high resistance grounded? What you're gonna have to do is add some transformers that are 480 to 48277. But what KVA size of that's gonna be? Maybe a 50 KVA. Well, 50 KVA is a low full load current, low fall current level. So I'm not as concerned about, you know, that protection, and that's how you do it. I get into a lot of systems where, what about ungrounded? With ungrounded, you may use what's called the zigzag transformer, or you may have a wide delta transformer the manufacturer may give you, or what they call a broken delta. It's three different versions that occurs. Um, I thought I understood zigzag transformers. We found out I didn't. In zigzag transformers, and if you go to my website, I've got an article on what happens on a zigzag transformer. I thought if I had this phase goes to ground, that all the current would just go through here and go to ground. Turns out it doesn't. Because you've got it a delta configuration, the currents end up circulating through the secondary of the transformer. And it turns out that the currents end up balancing. So that five amps of current, if I had limited to that, you'd have a third, a third, a third, go through each one of these, mm -hmm. and then the five amps go through this. If you want to read a cool paper, read my Georgia Tech zigzag grounding paper. Fascinating. Here's the specs. I don't need to go into that. Y'all can read that. Um, a lot of times, consultants want to calculate it. I've got the slides in the presentation, but due to time, I don't cover it. But I'll put a copy of this presentation on my website, along with this audio video um, on, the, on my website. I'll show you where that is at the end. And so you could actually go get that. I run into a lot of interesting applications with generators. So a lot of people call to me, come up to me and say, hey, my utility is solidly grounded. But when I go to the generators, I've got neutral grounding. How do I protect the system? 
Okay, you got two options. Okay, so the first thing I can do, <clears throat> all the protective relays now have more than one set of protective curves. Like in the multi lint, I can give you six different sets of curves. So where I could have the ground circuit for this, when this switches over, I could automatically switch to a second set of group settings and protect for the 400 amp. The other way, if this was say a 400 amp system, the other way you could do it, if you don't want to go and change those settings, is I would design this, that anytime I see more than 400 amps occurring, it, that this has also got that protection, okay? So just set the ground current where it sees 400 amps, it shuts down on the solid ground inside. So that's your two options for that. Um, if I'm using generators, all generators, they recommend you have an NGR. You will run across cases where there's different pitch on generators. And the most common pitch is two-thirds pitch, which is now the industry standards. But you may run into systems where they have five-six pitch. And I'm going, what the hell is pitch? So I actually stole this from Cummings. So I'm not plagiarizing them. I'm giving them the credit. Pitch, even though both of these are 60-cycle waveforms, the way they design the, the curve shape is different. And I can't, I can't tell you, I think this is probably the two-thirds and this is the five-six. But on these two generators, you can see this voltage is different. So you're going to actually have current flow because I've got voltage. So that's what is the difference in the pitch. So you can't have that. So we put a resistor in there to limit that current. Did y'all know that? Had y'all seen that before? Isn't that interesting? I've never seen them parallel two different ones, but I've seen them. Well, it's only on a system where you have a legacy generator. Um, and the new one. Yeah, and the new one next to it. There's a couple different products. Out there that are meant specifically to solve that problem. Right. So, but if you specified at this point, you probably want to specify two thirds pitch. Okay. And on a delta generator, there is no ground. So you got to get an NGR with a zigzag transformer, and we can provide that for you. Um, this was a really interesting article that I ran across, um, and it's on my website under the IEEE tab, called Low Zero uh, PDF. Everybody assumes that your positive sequence fault current is the highest, and so they designed that. That is not the case with generators. Your zero sequence component, because of the impedance in the generator, could be greater than the three-phase symmetrical component. And in this article, they talk about in this case, they had 125% uh, of the zero sequence, and literally all the equipment wasn't braced properly. I had this happen down at Beau Rivage. They realized when they went to generators, that was a problem. And I can help solve that by using NGRs. Okay. Um, I'm on the IEEE Pulp and Paper Subcommittee. So on large generators, the insurance companies came to us and said, You've got this 400 amp NGR. If that falls to the generator, you're dumping 400 amps into my generator for maybe 20 seconds because they take a long time to wind down. You need to come up with something to do that, to solve that and not do so much damage. That damage could be in excess of a half a million dollars. So, and I've got this on my website too. So the IEEE Pulp and Paper Subcommittee came up with what we call a hybrid grounding system. And in that, and I've actually seen this used on some three megawatt generators also. So the way that works is this is my low impedance grounded system, and it's 400 amp, and this contact is normally closed. This contact is designed if it sees a fault in the zone of protection, which I can sense with my multi lint relay. I will open this in within two milliseconds. At that point, this high resistance is in parallel. So now instead of 400 amps going into the fault, I can limit that fault to 5 amps, which is a very cool solution. So if you run across that, I can offer you this hybrid grounding and the relays to protect it. Any questions? Um, I've got some pictures of the equipment that I'm going to just cover real quickly. So this is what a typical NGR looks like. What is this? 
red thing. It's a CT. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we need to know. I like to monitor the voltage across the resistor and the current going through it. Somewhere you need a CT, especially on a 400 amp system, which is what this is. If I don't have the CT, after 10 seconds, you'll burn up the resistor. I usually, I usually go in that. Yes, it goes in that enclosure. enclosure. Yes, sir. Who buys that? It doesn't come with a resistor. Absolutely. It can. Absolutely. I thought it's always blocked by like no. no, no, no. I usually provide that with the system. Coordination. Yeah, but I mean, I know this is a 400 amp, so I'll give you a 400 if I see okay. um, If it's medium voltage, we can put bushings on there. I can put the bushing anywhere you tell me you want it. On the top, the side, front, middle, back. We also are going to have the CTs in there. I can give you a control box if you want to put a space heater in there. All kind of stuff. I've got, going back to the slide, I also do Monitoring, we use a uh, stat code. I can actually monitor the health of the resistor on medium voltage systems. Here's that contactor that'll open within two milliseconds. Um, here's the resistor outside. Here's just another picture. Sometimes I'll, I'll put it, this is an older one, but the way we used to use that rain shield, name of 3R. In this case, I put a box around the bushing. This one, we used a, a resistor or a transformer in there to lower the to low voltage. The pulsar plus unit, here's what it looks like. This unit's 20 inches by 20 inches by 90 inches tall. Um, I can have a separate control panel, the resistor outside, control panel inside, you know, if I want to test it. So that'll actually get that contactor to open and close. So we can do all that. We actually make a medium voltage pulsar. So this is what that looks like. I can limit that current to five amps. Sometimes they actually put it in the switch gear. So the pulsar is actually in this section right here. And then here's the uh, my website. I've got a tab called La Tripoli with a lot of great information. Here's that article on low zero sequence impedance. Um, the George Tech zigzag transformer. That hybrid grounding articles are right there. And then I'll update this. This is showing the 2015. But I'll update this to the 2020 version in the YouTube video. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this on there. Huh? Oh, this is an existing presentation. It is, but I've I've updated it. Yeah, yeah. This is the 2015s on the website. Or actually, I think that, I think that right now the 18 is on the website. But I'll put the new one. Okay, I have actually covered this before nine o'clock. <laughs> I will uh, now try and open this up to the questions. Questions? Let me uh, unmute everybody. Any questions? Uh, You're unmuted. Hey, I got a question for you, John. Uh, can you go over the slide that you Okay. Okay. This slide. Yeah. No okay, so what happens is I know what my resistive current is going through the resistor, correct? And in this case, it was five amps, right? Going to the resistor. I also know I have capacitive charging current in the system. In this case, it was about three amps. Now, if I've got busway, a lot of busway, yes, bus bars very close together, I see the charging current. Well, I've got a PBS. Uh, but the There's problem. a lot of capacitors on the front end of that UPS filtering. I had a system where we had 45 amps. So I had to go back to the manual lecture and work on it out to take those capacitors out. Well, we have like a good That's something we need to go look at your system. What's this? You've got NGRs. Oh, my God. 
Because I, I, there's a good chance on a data center, your capacity charging current is huge. Um, but in this case, I had the 5.3 amps of current. So it's just A squared plus B squared C squared. So I've got a total of 5.83 amps of capacity charge, total capacity current. And I need to make sure when I design that system. Mm -hmm. All that rise in voltage on the other three. The rise in voltage. The rise in voltage no, is due to one phase going to ground. Right? If this phase goes to ground, where's the neutral go relative to ground? No, no, no. The neutral is no longer at ground point. In theory, neutral and ground are at the same point. But if the A phase goes to ground, I've still got 277 volts here between the neutral and the ground. So relative to ground, the neutral is now floating at 277 volts. And relative to the other two phases, right, I know A phase to B phase has to be 480 volts. All I've done now Ground is just a reference, right? Since this is now at, at zero, this has to be at 480. Okay, so the A phase is grounded. A phase is grounded. So when A phase grounded, the neutral floated to 277, and relative to ground now, B and C phase are at 480 volts. Makes sense? Yeah. That's all. If you get that, you've got the whole concept. And that's why we get into the surge arresters and all that having to be rated line to line. Question came in. I'm sorry. You can go ahead. Question came in from the uh, over the line folks. Any rules of thumb for sizing 5 kV, 15 kV NGRs? Can the phase current be used as a guideline? The answer to that is no. Okay. Um, people always want to give me the phase current, full load current, but I don't care about that. I want to limit phase to ground, right? And if I use low impedance, I want to ground it typically to two or 400 amps. But if I do that, I've got to shut something down. Okay. If I can limit it to five amps, then, you know, I can continue to operate the system. But when I get into a 4160 volt system, or a, say a 13.8 kV system, I'm not real comfortable personally about having five amps circulating that whole time. You know, you need to make sure you have personnel, if you're going to do that, that are going to go find that fault and what's going on. Okay. Did I answer the question? So. Okay. I've got everybody unmuted, so in theory they can ask a question. Any other questions? If you have questions, feel free. Did this answer your question? <laughs> Is that what you put? Did you write that? Okay. Well, how do you approach cost justification? Obviously, it's an expense, I mean, depending on the size and scope uh, of this addition. Um, you know, from uh, you know a reliability perspective. Okay, uh, it's a great question, Carl. The cost of a neutral grounding system is so inexpensive; it blows my mind. Okay, you're talking for a Pulsar Plus system, for ballpark figure, and I'm using in user price. Yeah. It's probably about seven to eight thousand dollars. That is it. So I'm going to take a solid ground system, put this in, maybe the laborers double it. Yeah, sure. So you're talking 15 grand. For 15 grand, I'm now protecting all my personnel. So God forbid there's a fault. 15 grand, they're going to see five amps of current instead of 30,000 amps. Well, is there any precedent for, so if I'm doing a, uh, a 20 drive lineup into a plant that say solid grounded or you know ungrounded? Uh, is there a precedent for me to add that into just my system alone if the plant load doesn't want to do it as a whole in lieu of an isolation transmission and like that? 
instead of having to deal with the system associated with the driver liability and all the preparations I have to do for a drive? Um, that's, that's a great question. I, I love that question because what you would want to do at that point is you're going to add a drive isolation transformer right. ahead of it, right? Yep. So now my drive isolation transformer, let's say these are all small drives. So I put in a 50 kVA transformer, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're getting back to a 58 kVA transformer. What's my available fault current? You know, your variable fault current maybe is only 3,000 amps. Yeah. It's, it's, and that's if it's a dead short. So, you know, yes, I can add it to your system, but I'm not seeing 30,000 amps. You've already limited the fault current by using a transformer that's isolating it. Mm. So that alone probably would give you enough protection that I don't need to add the NGR. Yeah. In my, it's, you would have to do that cost analysis, yeah. but you've actually protected it by adding the drive isolation transformer. Uh, high resistance grounding, whenever you add the transformer to be able to pull single phase loads, if you unbalance after the transformer, if you have like a heavy phase imbalance, uh -huh. will that cause upstream tripping potentially? Um. The, you had, in theory, I have zero current going through the neutral ground resistor. So it has no effect on me, my system, and what you've added. Um, your unbalanced loads, you shouldn't have any issues unless your protective relays are not set properly. You know, we, one of the options we have is, you know, I know if I've got a three-phase load, I can monitor unbalance. And people don't realize about unbalance. A, 2% unbalance in voltage cause an 8% unbalance in current. A 3% unbalance in voltage can cause about an 18%. You can take the number squared and double it for the unbalance of current. And I had two plants side by side. This guy was burning up motors at 480 volts. The guy next to him had no issues. And the first thing I said is, tell me what your three-phase voltage coming in. And one of the legs, the voltage was lower. And if, if I've got A phase voltage at 480 and B phase voltage at 440, what do you have? I've got a voltage difference. If I've got a voltage difference, I've got current flow. And this is what we get into what's called negative sequence current. So now all of a sudden, they've got current running backwards. Mm -hmm. And that's a real problem. You actually, in, in my multi limb presentation, I've actually got it. Um, if you've got a 2% voltage unbalance, you need to derate all your motors by 10%. Because part of the current's not going forward, it's going negative or backwards because of that voltage unbalance. So if you've got the heavy single phase load, make sure you got a stiff enough source that all three voltages are still the same. Make sense? Good question. Any other questions? I've got everybody unmuted in theory. So you should be able to ask a question. Okay, John. I don't oh. think there's many 40 volts. There are a ton of them. I, I, don't, I won't do it because, you know, we're a land, it's all commercial. We well, have people that are right. And, and that gets back to my question when do I use it and when don't I use it? I go into a commercial building. I agree with you, Matt. They are, the personnel are not qualified. Okay? So I'm going to go with either solid grounded. Or some kind of low resistance because I want something to trip off. Okay, you got to have that. If I go into a pulp and paper mill, ninety-five percent of them have high resistance ground systems mm -hmm. and forty volts. Like the lower you base centers, you know, you have eight HRGs all the switch gear. Um, no, um, we only have the resistance grounding up on the main voltage side on the utility because of the generators. And you need to protect the generator. Well, it's a question of it. I've never seen a data center. Well, you're, you, they will definitely have low resistance. All yeah. generators, you talk well, to the generator. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yes. And they've got generators, so. If it's a five-mean-volt generator, yeah. Right. I mean. Well, most of them are. 
I just thought, just like a paper mill, we would want to be able to identify the ground fault <clears throat> where it is without shutting down, if, without tripping. If you're solidly grounded, you're screwing, you have to shut down something. But I think, like in a data center, do you have the, the you basically have them all on multiple sources. So you've isolated them that way, correct? Yes. So, so what's the most power or KVA that would be on a given circuit source from like, a transformer? Um, our transformer. Or, or a UPS. Well, we run minimal UPSs. Okay. Um, but uh, you know, we have uh, all of our transformers are around the three. MVA. Three MVA. Mark. Okay. You know, just the full lineup of them having well, see, 13, 8, then 480. See, you know, we talked about that 1500 had 30,000 amps. You've got three MVAs at 480 volt. You've got 60,000 amps of fault current available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the guy standing in front of it and goes face to ground, you just killed him, unfortunately. <clears throat> Y'all don't have UPSs. Minimal. What do you do to uh, get the generator while the generator's starting? Uh, all cabinets have a uh, battery backup unit. Oh, uh, they're battery backups. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> that makes sense. We, we only have UPSs on the net. Can the people calling in here the questions being asked here? Not, I can repeat them for you. Okay. So the service run at what voltage? Or DC volt or DC? Uh, well, I mean, we feed the bus away at you know, 480, which all of them. Okay. It all gets pushed down in the power supply at 480. I want to thank you, everybody. You know, if my team can help in any way, feel free to reach out to us and, you know, I can. All my info was on this first slide. Most of you know us anyway, but feel free to give us a call. Thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Be careful out there.